Welcome to this KLC Legal Department training video on handcuffs and Miranda rights. This webinar is the first of a series for our law enforcement members. If you go to the KLCIS website, you will also find a number of training videos done by Jack Ryan. After this training, should you have any questions, please feel free to contact me, Chris Johnson, Member Legal Services Attorney with KLC, or Troy Pitcock and Mark Filburn, who are our law enforcement experts with KLCIS. Thank you for joining us today. Enjoy the webinar. Hello, my name is Chris Johnson. I am KLC Member Legal Services Attorney. KLC has been asked to provide a training for our police officers on the situations that may arise when a suspect is handcuffed and whether or not that will always necessitate the reading of Miranda warnings. There are two distinct ways of looking at this case based upon the circuit courts and how they have ruled upon this. Uh, essentially they come down to two views on uh, this fact situation. The first is that uh, anytime handcuffs are applied you're going to need to read Miranda and we'll be looking at the circuit courts that have that opinion. Uh, there are also circuit courts that hold that just because someone is handcuffed that does not necessarily mean that Miranda warnings need to be read. In Kentucky there's a bit of a hybrid view on this in that there is some strong case law language that suggests uh, any physical contact uh, by the police may necessitate the need for Miranda uh, which obviously if you handcuff someone that may be present but uh, the Kentucky courts have not gone so far so as to state that this is the case in any and all situations and we'll be looking at the facts of those cases as well in Kentucky. To give you a little bit of idea of my background, uh, I am a graduate of Emory Law School in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, the first few years of my legal practice I was an assistant district attorney in Metro Atlanta on I-20 which is a major drug corridor so I got a lot of experience in search and seizure cases. Uh, I later moved to our appellate section where I uh, handled a broad spectrum of both felony and misdemeanor appeals before both, both the Georgia Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals. Uh, and I later transitioned to the Georgia Attorney General's office in their capital crime section where I ended up handling over 60 murder appeals on behalf of the state of Georgia. So I do have some experience in appellate work and uh, that is one of the reasons I was asked to uh, participate in this training today. So initially, where do these rights come from that we're going to be addressing? Well, they come from the Constitution, both at the state and federal level. And the, the rights all citizens have, uh, most famously, as anyone that's ever watched a police detective show or cop show knows, uh, it's the Miranda case from 1966. Uh, which held in a nutshell that people considered to be in custody must be formally informed of their rights prior to an interrogation. Uh, we've included the, the quote here that is the, um, the main portion of the Miranda v. Arizona case that states, the prosecution may not use statements, whether exculpatory or inculpatory, stemming from custodial interrogation of the defendant unless it demonstrates the use of procedural safeguards effective to secure the privilege against self-incrimination. By custodial interrogation, we mean questioning initiated by law enforcement officers after a person has been taken into custody or otherwise deprived of his freedom of action in any significant way. Now one thing you're going to see as we go through these uh, fact scenarios from the different circuit court cases is the courts seem to really pay a lot of attention on that freedom of action. Uh, we'll be looking at the analysis that uh, courts throughout the U.S. and in the state of Kentucky have used as to determining whether or not the freedom of action has been limited in such a way as to deprive an individual of their rights to the extent that Miranda is necessary. Uh, this is not to say, and this is one of the reasons that uh, Kentucky is still a little bit of a hybrid between um, the two uh, schools we're going to be looking at, is that New York v. Quarles in 1984 did recognize a strong safety exception uh, in the reading of Miranda uh, in that it held that the reading of Miranda may be excused when interrogation is reasonably prompted by a concern for the officer or the public safety. Uh, 
this is a classic situation where um, you get a recall and uh, you know there might be a, a suspect that's dropped a gun on a playground so you know the questioning kind of transitions not so much as to get an uh, inculp inculpatory statement from the wit or from the suspect than it is to protect those on the scene who uh, are just literal innocent bystanders uh, there is a Kentucky case that uh, two Kentucky cases that uh, have relied upon quarrels uh, the first is a Carver case which held that police officers in potentially dangerous situations can ask questions that are necessary to establish safety but may not ask questions that are designed to elicit testimonial evidence from the suspect. Again, that's the questioning that would be inculpatory towards the uh, defendant. Uh, and also the Henry case from 2008 held the quarrels exception depends on the objective evaluation of the officer's action and not on the officer's subjective motives, such as a credible report defendant abandoned a gun in a public area reasonably prompted the question. And uh, even going back to law school, this was one of the classic scenarios that was presented um, for the quarrels exception. If you can articulate objectively a uh, safety concern, uh, then uh, the, the Supreme Court precedent is strongly in your favor as far as just questioning um, a, uh, a defendant and we'll see some situations where this, this does arise. Uh, again, as far as warrantless searches and seizures, we'll see uh, that obviously Terry v. Ohio um, is uh, the, the gold standard, so to speak, as far as how police officers are to conduct themselves in uh, the, the conducting of a Terry stop. And the analysis that, that is going to be needed is, uh, does the officer have a reasonable suspicion? Was the stop limited in scope? Um, is the stop to determine if the person is armed? Uh, or is the stop to determine if the person is in the midst of criminal activity? So there's a bit of a dance between Terry and Miranda as to how far along a Terry stop has to be before Miranda needs to be read. Uh, the First and the Fourth Circuit have held that a suspect is not in Miranda custody if the Terry stop was lawful. Uh, the Second Circuit, Seventh Circuit, Eighth, Ninth, and Tenth have held that the reasonableness of a Terry stop is irrelevant as to a Miranda custody analysis if the circumstances of a Terry stop meet the threshold of Miranda custody. Then Miranda warnings are required before the suspect of a Terry stop may be interrogated. Kentucky is in the Sixth Circuit, which has not addressed this specifically as to whether or not it is or is not Miranda custody. Uh, there is some state precedent that Kentucky has that we will uh, be discussing towards the end of this. But in preparing this training, I just thought it would be good for our officers to have a broad uh, spectrum analysis as to the courts that have looked at this and you're going to see recurring factors that courts whether or not they always find Miranda is needed or find that Miranda may not be needed you're going to see certain magic phrases and clauses that pop up that you and your day-to-day -day policing will need to keep in mind so let's look at the cases that apply Miranda uh, US Supreme Court from 1983 California v. v Behaler uh, held that although the circumstances of each case must certainly influence the determination of whether a suspect is quote unquote in custody for purposes of receiving Miranda, the ultimate inquiry is simply whether there is a formal arrest or restraint on a freedom of movement, again, freedom of movement of the degree associated with a formal arrest. So what constitutes custody? How is an officer to act if there is no formal arrest? Uh, someone is just handcuffed for a safety reason. Uh, in all of these cases, the court is always going to look at the totality of circumstances. So if you are on the street and you're engaged in one of these uh, types of stops or, or, or arguably custodial situations, you need to make a very conscious decision to be able to articulate both at the time the stop is ongoing, but especially after the fact when you're writing that report, that there was reasonableness under the totality of circumstances for the behavior. Um, but again, whether or not the suspect is handcuffed when questioned is going to be a huge factor that the court will consider, 
especially in Kentucky, in that there is a strong propensity to hold that physical contact uh, is a is a pretty strong bit of evidence that Miranda is needed, and we will discuss that in a bit. So let's look at those jurisdictions where handcuffs have been held to equal custody. Uh, U.S. v. Newton is a Second Circuit case. Uh, in this situation, uh, initially, and in, in, in reading the case, the, the facts aren't really that well set out because um, this guy was on parole uh, for armed robbery, drug trafficking, and a third felony. And as a condition of parole, he agreed to allow his PO to visit and search his home as part of parole. Uh, which generally, at least in, in the cases I had in dealing with this, uh, at least in the state of Georgia, where I handled most of these, um, they viewed that as almost a complete waiver of Fourth Amendment rights. Um, that the, you know, if the if the PO had had suspicion or had cause to be there um, to toss belongings, uh, to use I guess not the the politically correct term. Uh, they can basically do it. Um, this case is, is a little different analysis. Um, and even the facts in this case, uh, normally I would think would be very strong for what the parole officer did. Uh, the parolee's mother uh, contacted his, his PO to say that uh, he, had, he had threatened both uh, the mother and her, her husband at the time. Uh, with the gun, and that the gun was kept in a shoebox by the door of the house, which, you know, obviously if you're a convicted felon, you, you don't need to be, you know, holding on to a gun in any way, shape, or form. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a felony as, as well as a violation of your probation and parole. Uh, so the parole officers went to the scene. Uh, they had knowledge that a gun was on site, so they handcuffed the parolee in the hallway of the house without reading his Miranda rights. Uh, he was asked if he had any contraband, uh, and he stated, I have a two and two in a shoebox, and uh, the 22 with ammo was recovered from the shoebox. He was convicted in federal court with possession of a firearm by a convicted felon, but on appeal, he asserted the trial court error erred in admitting statements made in response to questions before he was Mirandized, such as, you know, where, where's the shoebox, and, you know, do you have a gun? Uh, the second judicial circuit consists of New York, Vermont, and Connecticut. So I, I guess a lot of you all are saying, oh, New York, of course. Okay, they're, they're not going to like law enforcement. Uh, and they did rule that Newton was in custody for Miranda purposes. Uh, the court found that a reasonable person would believe that they were under formal arrest or restrained in their freedom of movement to a degree associated with formal arrest. And this is something that you need to keep in mind. Uh, because one of the analysis you're going to see that comes up in each and almost all of these cases is that that restraint of movement, the restraint of the freedom of movement. And uh, I, I know that a lot of y'all listening today, have, you know, you probably all of you have, have, have slap cuffs on a suspect uh, at least once. Uh, some of y'all may have had cuffs slapped on yourself in your younger indiscretions. Uh, and one thing the court is going to look at is, you know, exactly how free to leave is someone going to feel uh, once once their hands are cuffed behind their backs. Um, it, it, it's a question and an inquiry that somewhat answers itself, but that's not to say that the circumstances, as we will discuss in some of these cases, may be uh, objectively to such an extent that uh, handcuffing would not be considered custody for the purposes of Miranda. The two factors the court focused on, as I stated, was would a reasonable person in the suspect's shoes understand that the detention was not likely to be temporary and brief? And also, would a person stopped under the circumstances at issue feel completely at the mercy of the police? Again, if someone's handcuffed, chances are, and if this is the analysis being used, uh, the court's probably going to find that you know a reasonable person is probably not going to feel like they're going to be able to leave uh, in a brief amount of time. Um, and, you know, if, if you are handcuffed by a police officer, uh, there's, there's a strong um, leaning towards finding that you're, you're going to be at the mercy of the police in that situation. Uh, the court found and held that the use of handcuffs would make an ordinary person think that their detention would not be temporary and brief. Therefore, Individuals would believe that they were under the total control of the police and restrained to a degree normally associated with a formal arrest. Therefore, custody was affected. 
and the court finally closed by finding that handcuffing Newton, though reasonable to the officer's investigatory purposes under the Fourth Amendment, nevertheless placed him in custody for purposes of Miranda. Now, out of all the cases we're going to be looking at today, I think this is going to be the outlier, uh, especially based upon the facts that um, this is a parole situation. Um, I know in most of the probations and paroles that I handled um, as prosecutor, um, there are some pretty strong uh, waivers that uh, a defendant signs at the time a plea is entered as to what is and is not required of them on probation. And in very strong terms, oftentimes those waiver the Fourth Amendment rights of search and seizure um, are, are addressed. So if you have concerns about this or you think that this might be a situation um, that could come up in your community, uh, you might be wise to talk to your local Commonwealth attorney or local probation parole office to see exactly what the extent of the waiver is that uh, an individual signs. Another case that stated handcuffs would equal custody for the purposes of that case is an Eighth Circuit case, the Callan case. In this situation, a search warrant was executed at an apartment where it was believed that drug dealers were conducting business. A uh, number of adults at the scene, including Cowan, uh, were handcuffed. Uh, there were a few children on the scene who were not handcuffed at the time the warrant was issued. Cowan was, was frisked and his ID was retrieved from his wallet. Uh, he was asked why he was in Davenport, Iowa, and he stated that he uh, had taken a bus from Chicago. Uh, Cowan also had a set of car keys on his person, was asked, well, if you took the bus, why do you have your keys on you? And he say, said that he had a Cadillac that he left in Chicago and was unwilling to leave his keys with his girlfriend when he was not there to make sure she didn't drive it. Uh, obviously, under the circumstances, the detective didn't believe uh, Cowan. Uh, illegal drugs were found in the apartment, and uh, the this just kind of reminds me of the old old show, uh, uh, was, uh, not Double Dare, but uh, it was No Whammies, No Whammies, Big Buck Stop, uh, in that they removed Callan's handcuffs, gave him the keys, and said, you're free to leave if you hit the alarm button and it doesn't match any car in the parking lot. Well, you can you can guess what happens. Uh, the detective pressed the alarm button key for him. Uh, the alarm sounded and Callan was arrested. A uh, drug dog on the scene alerted the presence of drugs in Callan's car. Uh, there was crack found in the car. Uh, he was Mirandized and asked about the crack cocaine. He stated that he was paid $300 to drive the drugs from Chicago to Davenport. Uh, the court at the district level ruled that the detective's questions as to how Callan arrived at the Davenport apartment and why he had the car keys in his pocket asked prior to being told that his Miranda rights uh, violated his Fifth Amendment rights. The Eighth Circuit, when looking at this on appeal, and the Eighth Circuit consists of North Dakota, Minnesota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Iowa, Missouri, and Arkansas, uh, analyzed it by stating that a suspect could be considered in custody for Miranda purposes if a reasonable person in Callan's position would not have felt free to terminate the interrogation and leave. Again, this is a similar situation that we saw in the previous case. The Eighth Circle went on to find six non-exclusive factors for determining if the suspect is in custody. Uh, the first is, does the officer tell the suspect that the questioning is voluntary? Uh, is he told that the suspect is, fr is uh, free to leave if they wish to? Uh, is the suspect told that they can ask the officers to leave if the suspect so wishes? Uh, or was the suspect told that he was not considered to be under arrest for the purposes of the question? Second factor looked at was, uh, is the suspect's movement restrained during the questioning? Uh, third factor, which, which this is a factor that comes up in, in, in some cases, and if the suspect does initiate the contact, uh, I think there is some leeway that the officers may have. Um, or did the suspect voluntarily acquiesce to the official's request that the suspect respond to questions? Uh, it, did the police use strong arm tactics or de deceptive strategi stratagems? That's a word I can never say during questioning, which uh, the mental image I have from this is, you know, the old cartoons with the, 
you know, the, the person being questioning under the naked light bulb. Uh, if that's a situation, then yes, I think they're probably in custody for Miranda purposes. Uh, was the atmosphere of the questioning police dominated? Uh, this will come up in situations that are, if you're out in public generally, you know, if you're interviewing someone on the sidewalk or speaking to someone on the sidewalk, the courts tend to find that is not uh, police dominant as um, if you have them in the back of the cruiser or if they're actually taken down to the station. Uh, and finally, was a suspect arrested at the end of the questioning? Of the six factors, the critical inquiry to be made by the court was not whether the interview took place in a coercive or police-dominated environment, but rather whether the defendant's freedom to depart was restricted in any way. The Eighth Circuit held that Cowan was in custody because a reasonable person in his position would not have felt free to end questioning and leave based on the facts that they were handcuffed, detained, and patted down. He was not told he was free to leave other than the moment at the end of the initial questioning where uh, they, they played the car alarm. Uh, he was not told that he could abstain from answering questions, and he did not volunteer any answers to the police. One of the factors the court relied on was whether the defendant's freedom to depart was restricted in any way. And again, this goes back to what we mentioned at the very beginning, that handcuffing someone is a pretty strong indicator that their freedom to depart is going to be restricted. Uh, the court found that the fact uh, was apparent that the handcuffing, while one of multiple factors to consider, uh, that can establish custody for Miranda purposes. Uh, in this case, played a vital role in the analysis, even though an arrest was not officially made at the time that Callan was handcuffed. Uh, the court, as a result of this finding, suppressed the statement as to the keys and the cocaine evidence seized as a result uh, from his vehicle, as well as the seizure of the keys. But after looking at these two circuits, there are also circuits that have held that handcuffs may not automatically equal custody, which, when looking at the precedent in the state of Kentucky, in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, um, these are cases we really need to focus on because it could possibly give you those, uh, I hesitate to use the word loopholes, but loopholes that an officer may use in arguing that yes, the suspect was handcuffed, but no, he was not in custody and, and this did not necessitate a reading of Miranda. But again, these are extremely fact sensitive. There was a U.S. v. Batista, which was a Ninth Circuit case, uh, which involves California. So, you know, New York kind of ruled the way we thought New York would rule, but California uh, finds a little differently. Uh, the Ninth Circuit held that handcuffing a suspect does not necessarily dictate a finding of custody for Miranda purposes, but was a reasonable measure to ensure officer of public safety. Public safety. This is one thing that we need to be very cognizant of in any analysis or even if you are actually in the situation on the street as to if handcuffing someone and the questioning is going to necessitate Miranda. If there is a public safety issue, you're going to have some leeway. And this is even backed up by, by Kentucky law. Uh, under the Ninth Circuit, three men robbed a bank. Officer spotted Batista and another individual a half mile away from the bank. Uh, they were three and a half blocks from the suspected getaway car as well. Uh, the two matched the robber's descriptions that were given by the witnesses, and they were stopped for questioning. Police got out of their vehicles, and Batista voluntarily told the police that he had just gone to a nearby home to ask the woman who lived there to call a cab for the two men. Uh, he gave some shady backstory as to, as to why they were in the neighborhood. Both men were frisked. No weapons were found. Uh, both men were handcuffed at this time uh, so the officers could investigate a little further. One of the officers stayed with Batista and the other individual while uh, the other officer went to the woman's house to confirm the story. Uh, she did confirm that Batista did ask for a cab to be called but uh, disagreed with Batista's initial cover story in that she said Batista said that the cab was needed because the car they had in the area had broken down. There was no mention of a car by Batista in his initial questioning to the police. Uh, both men were separated, and as good police work uh, normally 
uh, shows. Uh, neither one uh, could could corroborate anything the other one said. Uh, they didn't know each other's names, what street names they were coming from, didn't know who dropped them off in the area, didn't know why they were in the area or who they were meeting, and couldn't even identify the color of the car that dropped them off. Batista eventually switched the story to say, hey, we were here to buy drugs. Uh, Ten minutes after the initial stop, both men were arrested. Uh, they were both taken to the police station, searched and Mirandized. Uh, several bait bills used to identify stolen money were found. Uh, both men confessed to the robbery. However, on appeal, the defendants argued that they were in custody when they were interviewed separately. Uh, the officer's failure to Mirandize at that time required the suppression of all subsequent statements was the argument that they made to the appellate court. However, the Ninth Circuit Court held that Miranda warnings are a necessary precursor to interrogation during a Terry stop if the, su if the suspect is taken into custody or if the questioning takes place in a police-dominated or compelling atmosphere. Again, we're seeing the same words applied in all these, all these circuits, whether or not they um, state that handcuffs necessitate custody for the purposes of Miranda. Uh, in this situation, they found that even though a Terry stop inherently is somewhat coercive, uh, typically it does not involve the type of police-dominated or compelling atmosphere necessitating a Miranda warning. The court held that Miranda warnings are only required when such a restriction on a person's freedom is placed so as to render them in custody. And again, if someone is handcuffed, this is going to be something the courts are going to consider. Uh, similar to the factors we looked at earlier, uh, you're going to look at the language used by the officer to summon the individual, uh, the extent to which the individual is confronted with the evidence of their guilt, uh, the physical surroundings of the interrogation, again, are you on a street corner or in the back of a cruiser or in a, in a holding cell, uh, the duration of the detention and the degree of pressure applied to detain the individual. So the degree of pressure applied, um, handcuffing court indicated that these objective factors would determine if a reasonable innocent person in the same circumstance would conclude that after a brief questioning they would not be free to leave and were therefore in custody for Miranda purposes. The court held that Batista and his accomplice were not in custody during the separate questioning because neither were confronted with any evidence of guilt. Again, the court paid a lot of attention to the objective factors at this time. You've had a bank robbery, in the area, they're responding to the scene. These are people that match the description. It's a brief investigatory stop to see, um, you know, what they're doing in the area. And frankly, the, the Batista story fell apart at that point. Uh, there were other factors weighing against custody, in that the language used by the officers to summon Batista was not coercive. Again, this is just a they were on the scene. Uh, the physical surroundings during the separate questioning was not coercive. Uh, they were separated at the scene and questioned at different sides of the sidewalk. And the duration of the detention was not coercive. Uh, it, was a, it was a brief time uh, that they were initially questioned, and there was no indication that, you know, if they said, hey, we're here visiting, you know, my grandmother uh, to cut her grass, that they would not have been free to leave. The only difference is the use of handcuffs here, uh, in that separates the facts of Batista from a routine Terry stop. The only difference here uh, between the facts of Batista and a routine Terry stop was the use of handcuffs. Uh, but the court held that the use of handcuffs alone does not mean that the suspect is in custody for Miranda. Another case that found handcuffs does not automatically equal custody was the LeShuck case out of the Fourth Circuit. Uh, Fourth Circuit includes uh, the Carolinas, the Virginias, and Maryland. Defendant sought to suppress statements made after an initial confrontation by deputies at a marijuana cultivation site, but before they were Mirandized. The court's analysis held, as we've heard, that Miranda is meant to protect statements that a suspect makes during custodial interrogations. They found that a suspect is in custody for Miranda purposes, obviously if a suspect has been formally arrested, and as we've seen, if the suspect is questioned under circumstances where the suspect's freedom of action is curtailed to such a degree associated with a formal arrest. These factors would not necessarily convert a Terry stop into a suspect being held in custody for Miranda purposes. As I've tried to instill upon you, 
the circumstances of the interrogation has to be viewed objectively not through the subjective views harbored by the interrogating officer at the time. So this is why it's important when you are on the scene to mentally be cataloging all of these objective factors that is playing into the actions you are taking um, because your, your subjectiveness is not going to be at issue on the appeal in these situations. It's going to be objectively what you are aware of on the scene as we saw in the earlier case as far as the, the two officers responding to the, the bank robbery objectively they were acting well within um, proper procedures. Another factor that's important is to look if the stop lasted longer than necessary to verify or dispel the officer's suspicion. Uh, this goes back to the bank robbery case and the earlier case. Uh, if it's a brief encounter uh, or doesn't stretch you know into half hour, hours on end, uh, it's just a brief investigatory inquiry, uh, then, then that will bolster the argument that um, handcuffing alone may not rise that encounter to a Miranda stop. The court held that the defendant was not in custody for Miranda until after the officers discovered the marijuana and they were informed that he was under arrest. Although the deputies did not handcuff Leshek during the course of the encounter. In this case, the Fourth Circuit noted the following as to Fourth Amendment seizure standards. And frankly, this is pretty much in keeping in a lot of ways with what Kentucky looks at. And that is, we have concluded that drawing weapons, handcuffing a suspect, placing a suspect in a patrol car for questioning, or using or threatening to use force does not necessarily elevate a lawful stop into a custodial arrest for Miranda purposes. Now that's not to say that you can start pulling your guns on anybody on the street to ask them questions, but it is an acknowledgement that you all have a very important and dangerous job and sometimes things happen to where for your safety and the safety of others some of these actions may need to be taken. That is not to say that if a encounter is to the level that you're placing cuffs on someone just to place cuffs on them and then question them that Miranda is not most likely going to come into play. So after all of this analysis as to what the circuits have held, what's a Kentucky case look like? Well, the Smith case in 2010 uh, applied a totality of circumstances uh, to look at the, the facts surrounding the case to see if a reasonable person, again, that reasonable person who was handcuffed would believe that they were free to leave. So it's, it's, it's the same analysis in a lot of ways as, as what the feds have been looking at. Uh, the Kentucky court cited the U.S. v. Mendenhall case from 1980 that identified the factors uh, that the Kentucky court looked at, which are similar to what we've looked at in, in the circuit court cases, is that, uh, is there a threatening presence of several police officers at the scene? Uh, is there a display of a weapon by an officer? The third factor is a big one. Is there a physical touching of a suspect by an officer? If you're putting cuffs on a suspect, what are you doing? You're touching them. So, at least in Kentucky, this is a strong indication that the presumption is going to be custody for the purposes of Miranda if cuffs are applied. So, in the vast majority of circumstances, if cuffs are applied, then Miranda would be not only necessary but appropriate. But as we're going to talk about here in a second, that's not to say that that's, that's the end of the discussion. There could be factors to where you're still going to be okay. Uh, the court also looked at the use of tone or language that would indicate compliance. So the suspect is being compelled by the officer. So in a lot of ways, this isn't necessarily an analysis just as to handcuffing. It's, it's just any encounter you have with a suspect on the street or, or just a, even a citizen on the street as to what sort of behaviors and conduct um, you can have that not only is going to be okay for the purposes of whether or not Miranda needs to be read, but even if it's a valid Terry stop or not. 
another court case that um, the Supreme Court of Kentucky looked at is the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, case from 1998, uh, which looked at these additional factors, which was the purpose of the questioning. Is there a danger imminent, such as a firearm being close to the scene? Again, these are factors we've seen in other cases. Uh, whether the place uh, where the questioning is taking place is hostile or coercive. Again, are you on a street corner or are you, on, are you under a naked light bulb in a locked closet somewhere? And the length of time that the questioning takes place, which length of time for Terry is, is just something that you're always going to need to address. Uh, the shorter the better in most cases. Uh, other custody indicators are, um, was the suspect told at the time of questioning that the questioning was voluntary. Um, was the suspect told that they were free to leave at any time or was the suspect told that if they didn't want to talk to the police they could tell you know the officers to leave if they're you know talking at the person's residence or something like that. So in Kentucky the Supreme Court held that an investigation appeared to implicate Smith and drug trafficking and this is a situation where um, I, it, I don't necessarily want to say that bad facts make bad law, but um, I, I would love to know the circumstances leading up to uh, the officers kicking in doors in this situation. Uh, because the officers did use dynamic entry, Smith was home with her two children, Smith was immediately handcuffed, but she was not Mirandized. Uh, she was asked if she had any drugs or weapons on her, and she said that she had some crack in her pocket, and it was four, four crack rocks. Um, which, uh, it, you know, a, as a, as a dealer, that's that's a that's a small amount uh, of weight. Um, you know, it, it's in, in at least in my experience, that's pretty much in keeping with, um, you know, personal use. Uh, although we will see that she does make some incriminating statements later. So I, I somewhat, although the 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 case itself doesn't really in the facts get into this, I kind of think this is a situation where. Um, the, the court may have seen this as, as, a, as an overreach as far as the procedures used. Uh, Smith was later Mirandized at the scene. She made a statement to the effect that she sold just enough drugs to get by. Uh, the Supreme Court held that Miranda custody was attained by the police pretty much from the moment the front door was kicked in. Uh, she was handcuffed, which the court focused on, as we discussed, that that's a physical touching. And it was clear from the factors that she was not free to leave and did not possess an unrestrained freedom of movement. So again, freedom of movement, handcuffing, physical touching. These are all things to consider. And finally, the handcuffing itself was a restraint on the freedom akin to a formal arrest. So in Kentucky, taking all these factors in mind, discretion being the better part of valor, if you have handcuffed someone and need to question them further, best practice would seem to indicate that you're going to need to Mirandize them at that time, absent there being a public safety issue. But, and again, I, I said that there was a, you know, there, there is, is a, a bit of a loophole left here for the officers uh, having to do with, with safety. Um, the Supreme Court, in a footnote, gave police the authority to still exercise their discretion as to when handcuffing may not elevate a Terry stop into Miranda custody. Uh, and they basically said that it doesn't rise to a Miranda stop as long as the circumstances warrant that precaution. Specifically, they found that when an officer is justified in believing that the individual whose suspicious behavior they are investigating at close range is armed and presently dangerous to the officer or others, it would appear to be clearly unreasonable to deny the officer the power to take necessary measures to determine whether the person is in fact carrying a weapon and to neutralize the threat of harm. I think it is not that much more of a leap to say that the court might be amenable to also, um, you know, the facts that we discussed as far as, you know, gun on a playground, situation like that. Um, but at least in Kentucky, there's going to be a strong presumption that absent this imminent threat, basically, um, if you handcuff someone, 
that, uh, that you're going to need to Mirandize them if, if, if continued questioning is needed. The court found that while handcuffing will necessarily weigh strongly that there is custody, they were not willing to adopt a bright line rule that it always is. Again, all relevant factors must be weighed and then an ultimate determination made upon the totality of the circumstances. So this is again why I'm encouraging you all to be very aware on the scene as to the objective factors you are citing that would not only lead you to the decision that handcuffs were necessary, but if is there a public safety or a safety issue that would necessitate further questioning at that time absent the reading of Miranda? Um, or would the reading of Miranda somehow um, harm the situation you're in even further um, should that person decide that they want to assert their rights? Um, going back to the beginning of this presentation, I mean, I think 90% of the people you arrest would be able to to say their their rights if they were ever seen law and order, but it's it is a it is a Supreme Court uh, constitutional protection that all people are entitled to. So this is just a factor and 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 a really large analysis that I just encourage you all just from your day to day policing to keep in mind. So as we said, uh, it does not by itself alone trigger a need for Miranda, but it weighs extremely heavily on the side that the warning should be given absent an immediate threat. I hope this has helped you all out. Um, I am in my office uh, pretty much constantly and have access to, to email and my phone 24-7. If anything arises or I can be of any further assistance, please don't hesitate to call me. I thank you so much for your time and uh, look forward to working with you all in the future. Thank you.